Hi, today we're going to talk about glass. Um, specifically, basically the properties of glass that are useful to us for forensic science. Um, so you should have your notes in front of you. You can um, put them on the correct page that it says in Canvas in your notebook. Um, and then we will get started filling them out. So what is glass? Let's define it first. Glass is a hard amorphous material made of silica, ash, and other oxides. Um, and silica is basically a fancy name for um, sand, okay? Um, so silica is sand, okay? So obviously glass is made of sand. And then ash, it's also called um, soda ash. And basically it is um, sodium, carbon, and oxygen. It's like a, a compound that reduces the melting point of sand. Um, in order to make the glass. And then the different oxides that you add to it give the glass different properties. Um, colored glass, um, melting points, um, strength, etc., etc. Okay, so you take sand and you heat it to extremely high temperatures, right? Um, we're talking like 2,000, 3,000 degrees. Um, if you add the ash to it, it brings that melting point down just a little bit so that you're within like 900 to 1,000 degrees, still pretty high. And then you add the different oxides and you uh, basically melt the sand and that's what creates glass. So it's, it's a, pretty cool, um, a pretty cool thing that happens. So that's what glass is made of. Um, different types of glass depend on what's in it. So where it says why and how is glass different in your notes, well here's some of the reasons. And you don't need to necessarily write all of these, but you may want to jot a few of these down. Um, if you add um, something like boron oxide, it increases temp stability. So that's in like your Pyrex dishes, like your glassware that you use to bake cakes with and uh, casseroles and things like that. If you add lead to glass when you're making it, it increases the density and refractive index. It makes it sparkle. So like crystal glassware has lead in it. Uh, manganese cleans up the color. So they always add manganese when they want clear glass. So if you have like clear glasses at home or things like that, it has manganese in it and that it takes the fogginess out of it. Um, iron and sulfur change the color of it to brown, like beer bottles. You know how they're brown in color. Um, they have iron and sulfur in it. Chromium makes green and cobalt makes red. So those are some of the different things that they can add, the oxides that they can add to glass that will change its um, composition um, and temperatures and color and different things like that. Um, some of the common types of glass, um, you've got a spot for this. Again, you don't need to necessarily probably write all of these, but you may want to jot a few of them down. Some of the common types of glass that are out there, um, window glass, electric light bulbs, and glass containers all use what's called soda lime. So it has the soda ash in it, and they add lime to it, and that's what makes um, those types of see-through glass um, containers. Uh, fine tableware, crystals, artwork, vases, things like that, that has soda lead in it. That's the oxide. Um, we already talked about boron oxide, the boron silicate, which is your heat resistant things like Pyrex stuff that you can put in the oven or the microwave and it won't crack because it gets too hot. Um, chemical wear is um, cilia, that is, um, or sorry, silica. Your stuff that you use, beakers, test tubes, things like that, you can add acid to it, you can add bases, you can heat it up. That's all your chemical wear has silica in it. Um, sidecar windows are tempered glass which means that they are made so that if you get in a car accident, they just shatter into like millions and millions and millions of pieces. And then laminated glass is used in windshields. And the purpose of that, they put like a, a, a thin piece of laminate, a clear laminate in between the pieces of glass for your windshields. Um, and that is specifically so that if somebody gets in an accident and you hit it, it kind of cracks, but it doesn't shatter or shard so that if you go through the window, um, basically you don't die from just um, glass shards. It kind of it kind of cracks more like paper, like it's got like a paper layer to it. It's kind of weird to see, um, but it's got a little bit of give or bend to it. And that helps so that um, you don't get as injured in car accidents. So those are just some of the common ones that are out there. So why is glass valuable for forensic scientists? Well, one of the big reasons is that you find glass at a lot of crime scenes. Um, car accident sites, 
uh, breaking and entering situations, if there's been a fight or some type of struggle at a crime scene and anything breaks, a lot of times there's glass found at crime scenes. And the different types of glass can be compared using their physical properties, which gives us a lot of class characteristics. And then occasionally they can be reconstructed back into their original pieces. And that gives us individual evidence, which is nice too. Um, so glass is kind of similar to soil in terms of most of the characteristics are, are class characteristics. However, there's a couple of different ways that they can be they can be individualized to make them unique. So let's take a look at some of the physical properties of glass that we can analyze. Um, you're on the left side of your notes here. Uh, color is one of the physical properties. What's the shade of the glass? Is it you know tinted green? Is it tinted brown? Is it red? Um, and you can use that to kind of determine the oxides and you can compare. Like if you find green, gra or gr green glass at your crime scene um, and then your suspect has green glass embedded in their shoe, you can kind of compare those and see if they're the same shade. Um, the thickness of the glass, you just use a ruler and you measure in millimeters, but different glasses have different thickness depending on what they're used for. Um, like eyeglasses versus windshield glass. Windshield glass is super thick because it's a double layer and it's got laminate in it. Eyeglasses are usually, um, because they're concave and convex lenses, um, they usually have a different thickness compared to like, say, a drinking glass or a glass plate or something like that. Um, so you can always compare the thickness of the glass when you're looking at it. Um, you can see what fluoresces under the UV light as well. Some glass will fluoresce under the UV light a bright white color and some won't, depending on what oxides are in it. So those are three of the physical properties that you can kind of take a look at um, to see. The fourth one is density. Density is measured by um, taking a look at the mass of the object and dividing it by its volume. And I'm sure you guys have done density in a lot of different classes before. Um, so the equation for density is right here, okay? Uh, density is mass divided by volume. Mass divided by volume. And it, the nice thing about density, it just doesn't matter how much of a substance we have. Um, if you have a small mass, you could have a smaller volume. If you have a bigger mass, you'll have a bigger volume. And so it's still a comparable um, characteristic no matter what size. You have a tiny shard or a big piece, you can still compare the densities equally. Um, so in order to run a density test, you use a scale to find the mass. So you literally just take your glass piece and you put it on the scale and you figure out what the mass is. And then most of the time for density as far as volume goes, they use water displacement. So what they'll do is they'll fill a test tube, um, or sorry, a graduated cylinder up to say seven milliliters. They'll add the glass to it, and if it goes to 10 milliliters, they'll know that the glass was three milliliters um, for its volume, right? Because the water went from seven to 10. So you subtract those two numbers, and that was how much the glass took up. And so once you have the mass and you have the volume, you just divide those two numbers and that gives you the density. And here's some of the densities of the common glasses that are out there. So when they figure out what the density of an unknown glass is, and they can compare it to this chart, and they can figure out, okay, most likely it's window glass if it's between 2.46 and 2.49. Is it headlight glass? Is it Pyrex? Is it lead? So they take a look at the density along with the other characteristics and they can kind of determine what type of glass it is. Okay, so that's one of the other characteristics is density. The fifth characteristic that we're gonna talk about for today is refractive index. This is probably a new characteristic for lots of you guys in terms of one that you've seen in other science classes. Refractive index is the measure of light bending due to changing velocity when it goes from one medium into another. In this case, the light is traveling through the air and it hits the glass. And as it hits it, it slows down, right? It's going faster in the air than it's going in the glass. So it slows down and as it slows, it bends the light. And that is the what we call the refractive index. Index, And that is unique to each piece of glass, so it's super valuable to us, which is nice. So we're gonna take a look at how to actually complete that test. What you do is you do an immersion method test to find the refractive index. A lot of times we, um, uh, abbreviate refractive index with an RI. 
So you immerse the glass fragment into a liquid that you already know the refractive index for. So all the liquids that are out there, water, glycerin, olive oil, vegetable oil, they all, they've already tested the refractive index for all of those liquids. So what you would do is you'd find one that you know the refractive index for, you put the glass into it, so you put like the liquid in a Petri dish, you put the glass into it and you put it underneath a microscope, and then you look for what's called the Becky line. The Becky line is a halo-like line that appears around the glass when it's in liquid. So it looks like this, here's some two examples down here. Do you see, it's, let me, let me see. It's this line right here. It's the, like the white glow. It's the white glow right here. And on this piece of glass, it's on the inside edge, which means if the line is on the inside of the glass, the glass has a higher refractive index than the liquid. So then you'd want to take it out of that and you'd want to find a liquid that has a higher one and put it in that one. If it's on the outside, so like right here, you can see it, you can see it over here. On this piece of glass, it's on the outside edge. The glass has a lower refractive index than the liquid. So if you can see the Becky line, you need to take the glass piece out and you need to try a different liquid. The goal for the refractive index test is to find what we call match point. And match point is when the Beck line completely disappears from view and you can't see it on the outside or the inside and it almost appears like the glass disappears into the liquid as well. And then you know you've hit match point. That means that the glass is refracting exactly the same amount of light as the liquid that it is currently in. So right here is a match point. You can see if you put the glass into this, you can still see it here. If you put it over here, you can still see it, but right here, you can see that the glass fragment almost completely disappears in the liquid, and then you know you've hit match point, and then you would wanna record the refractive index um, for that particular liquid because now you know it's the same as your glass. So that's how you do the immersion method to find refractive index, okay? So line on the outside of the glass, it's a lower RI than the liquid, so you're gonna want to find a liquid that's lower than the one you're in. Glass, uh, Becky line on the outside, or sorry, the inside of the glass, you wanna look for a higher refractive index liquid. If you hit match point and you can't see the Becky glow at all and it looks like the glass disappears into the liquid, you've hit match point and you know it's refracting the same amount of, of light, okay? And this is kind of a unique test to do too for glass. Um, and so this is one that they do a lot and then they, they're able to, um, to use that along with density and color and thickness and fluorescence to say, okay, we have all of these things in common with our unknown glass, we probably have a match, okay? So they use, um, and here's some different refractive indexes. So I told you guys that there's a bunch of liquids, water, olive oil, glycerin, here's the refractive indexes, and then here's the refractive indexes for some of the common glasses that are out there. And you can see that if you put them in different different ones of the liquids, you would find a match. You would find one that would refract the same amount of light. The last property is fractures, but fractures have a ton of information to it. So we're gonna actually um, split fractures off into their own lesson. So as you're thinking about all these different physical properties, if you had an unknown piece of glass at your crime scene, say you found like a small glass fragment at your crime scene, um, and then you collected your suspect and your suspect had glass fragments in the bottom of their shoes, you could run all of these tests, color, thickness, fluorescence, density, and refractive index on both pieces of glass, the one from the suspect's shoe and the one at your crime scene. And if you could find all of these characteristics in common, that would be pretty good evidence that it's possible that your suspect was at your scene or dropped the glass at your scene, okay? And so that's how we use that. You guys will use all of these characteristics in your next lab, the characterization of glass lab.